Okay, it looks like it's recording. There's, uh, yeah, it says, um, okay. Okay, let's just make sure it says it's recording, but it, okay, I think we're good. I would hate to do the whole thing and then have it not work. Okay. Yeah, try to be sort of good. Yeah, all right, here we go. My name is Jennifer Geyer Jowett from Lansing, Michigan. Today is March 7th, 2021. I am interviewing Glenda Funk from Chubbuck, Idaho for the Oral History Project titled COVID-19 Teacher Poets Writing to Bridge the Distance, which will be archived by Oklahoma State University Oral History Research Program. So Glenda, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you became an educator and where and what you are doing now? Oh, how I became an educator. Well, I knew I was going to go to college and I didn't really know what else to do because um, I have limitations and better cognitively than I am physically, I suppose. So in the late seventies, um, there weren't a lot of choices, teacher, nurse, missionary. <laughs> so teacher. Okay, very good. I had a really significant teacher, like everyone, you know, too. It just seemed like the right thing to do, but I don't want to call it a calling because I don't like that metaphor. So what events or experiences led you to become a teacher other than just landing into that role? Um, I don't know. Um, I, it, it just seemed like the only thing I was interested enough in at the time based on what I knew. Um, I don't know what choice I would make now, but I didn't realize, you know, that I could possibly have more choices. It was the late seventies. I grew up in a very conservative state in Missouri, but I knew I wanted to go to college. My father wanted me to go to college. And, you know, so I knew from the time I was seven years old, I didn't know a lot about what college was, but I took a good look around, look, uh, look around at how people lived, and I knew I wanted to live better than we did. We were poor, and I had to make some choices that then would um, um, provide an opportunity to to live a better life, a more economically secure life. Uh, in those days, teachers had a lot more respect than they have now. Um, it was a lot more difficult to get a job because there was not a teacher shortage. And so you were vying for positions. So there was a lot more prestige with the idea of being a teacher. Um, not that teachers had all that many rights. They were just beginning to gain some. I remember when I moved to Idaho in 1989, I learned that it had only been a couple of years since the teachers, uh, female teachers were allowed to wear pants to school which I thought was mortifying, <laughs> you know, the thought of having to wear a dress. Uh, I'm not sure that I owned a dress when I moved to Idaho, but <laughs> never went anyway. That's so interesting. Um, I didn't have any really. I, I think I may have had one dress when I went to college, and I had to buy um, dresses because I went to Southern Baptist University, and in order to eat lunch on Sunday, you had to wear a dress to the cafeteria, it was the only meal worth eating all week long. Um, the food was horrifyingly bad, so I was thin in those days. And you might as well get up and go to church since you have to put on a dress to go to <laughs> eat lunch. And it, it was really a, an exercise in a forced fast if you missed um, Sunday lunch. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, <laughs> how, how long into your teaching process then did you, did it take you to realize that this was the career you wanted or you had landed in the right space or, you know, that you had been destined to be a teacher or did you never feel that way? Um, I, I always felt like it was the right thing to do and I never wanted to go into another profession. I didn't want to um, be an administrator, had no desire to be anything but a classroom teacher. Um, I didn't intend to be an English teacher, but in Missouri, you have to be certified to teach speech or, or to teach English in order to teach speech and coach debate and teach theater. And so I had not planned to be an English teacher. And then I got married in um, September of 1981 and moved to Arizona and was very lucky to fall into a job uh, mid-year there and it was teaching english to immigrant students primarily migrant students 
and it, it was culture shock, but it was really good for me too. It was a very rewarding experience. And so from the onset, I never felt like I knew enough. So how, how, so how long into your career then did you feel like you knew enough? Did you feel like you had never. everything <laughs> under you? <laughs> I, never, I have never felt like I've known enough. You know, um, you, you know, you try to appear competent to students and, but you soon realize that you're going to have students who are smarter than you are, more brilliant, more naturally gifted, and you have to work. Uh, those students will push you to work and to learn and to study. And that's the benefit of teaching speech is that you have to constantly be on top of issues and current events and social issues and things of that nature. But I've never felt like I knew enough as far as teaching goes and there's always more to learn in terms of the pedagogy. And, um, and, and so I've never, I, I guess I'm one of those always dissatisfied people, you know, perpetually dissatisfied and. Or that, maybe always uh, curious, always, maybe always curious. Yeah, always want to know more. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Okay. Um, let's go back to March of 2020. This is about a year back now. Um, how did you learn that teachers in your state were going to be quarantined? Um, I don't know how I learned since I, I was retired at the time. I retired at the end of 2019 and I don't know how I initially found out if probably through some friends, some colleagues, uh, I watched the news. And so, um, I was already following what was going on with COVID and we had had trips canceled and, you know, uh, I had hoped against hope that we wouldn't have a problem, but Probably a friend, a friend must have told me, a former colleague must have told me it's how I found out. What do you remember is most significant about that time um, when COVID hit and things began to shut down? Mm. Well, for me, it was thinking, well, crap. I taught all these years, 38 years. I had this plan for retirement and I intended to have a big travel year in 2021 or rather 2020, just as I did in 2019. And then I was kicking my butt for not going somewhere during Christmas break. I, around Christmas time when we talked about it, I thought, oh, we already had so many trips this year. Uh, let's just go ahead and wait until the spring. And we were going to go to Asia and to, um, to Singapore and to Hong Kong and Vietnam. And, and then that trip got canceled. So it was sort of being in limbo and then hoping against hope. And then, you know, um, I, I was already at home so much as a retired person. And, and, and so I think in some ways, and I, I was already sort of acclimated to the idea of being homebound um, since I had, you know, retired. I'd been retired for, I guess, about a year at that point. No, not quite a year. I retired in uh, my, my first date of retirement was September 1st, 2019. Okay. So, but I'd had a few months to get used to being home. Okay. So obviously the loss of travel was a big loss. Were there any other losses or concerns that you had at that time? Um, not really. Um, I mean, I, my sense of loss was more for other people and, and thinking about them. And, you know, I still had former students who were still in school, the kids who were juniors my last year and then seniors in, in 2020 and then um, just sort of sitting back and watching um, what the world was doing. It's really disheartening in a lot of ways to see the anti-maskers, anti-science anti people, the lies coming out of the White House, um, all of those kinds of things. Those are the sort of things that really upset me, but we'd already been dealing with that from um, the moment Trump announced his candidacy in 2015. And I had already had a huge adjustment in my teaching when uh, the terms alternative facts and fake news reared their ugly head. I had to do a complete shift 
in in my approach and my uh, rhetoric classes. And, and so those were the kinds of things within that time frame that those Trump years that were that that were really discombobulating to me. And so sitting back and watching the response to COVID, um, I wasn't surprised at the racial slurs. Um, I wasn't surprised about the lies or shocked about them. Um, a bit more shocked about the extent to which people believed them. I was thinking the other day when I had um, a memory pop up from in February in my Facebook, and it was going down to Salt Lake City to hear Trevor Noah. And that was the last time we sat in a concert like venue. And it was in um, the venue where the Utah Jazz play basketball is where that show was. And so um, that was the last moment like that. And, and, and you're not ready for that. But I knew enough about history uh, to know the possibilities, you know, that this pandemic would last a year or two. Um, I didn't expect the vaccine to be developed this quickly, but once I started learning about, learning about the technology involved in it, then, um, then I understood. And so I was really glad to see it being developed so quickly. I'll just be glad when I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting that the last main event you went to was Trevor Noah. Are there any takeaways yeah. from that that you can apply to what we're experiencing now? either ironically or? You know, he's less political in his show in an arena like that than he is on his television show. Okay. And so um, that was really interesting. And I wonder whether or not he adapts that show based on the city he's in. And, you know, Utah's a pretty conservative state, but, but I don't know. And so um, I just wasn't ready to never be able to, you know, go anywhere or do anything of that nature. And well, yeah. So you had mentioned your juniors and um, so they would have, they would be seniors this year, right? Would that be correct? Last year they were seniors. But they were seniors last year. Okay, so you, so you missed. Okay. Was it typical for you to attend graduation parties for them? And how did that unfold? Um, well, I always attended graduation, and so it was interesting that I sat on the stage at graduation. I was my school's teacher of the year, and and um, the teacher of the year sits on the stage, and and um, so I sat on the stage during that ceremony. And then last year, twenty twenty, they didn't have a typical graduation ceremony. Um, it was difficult to watch the community reaction and some of the parents there were there were things that um parents of students i just really admired and adored things that parents did they had an alternate graduation ceremony uh, apart from what the school planned and they um, decided that it was okay for them to ignore the permitting of a local facility and because they wanted to use it for their alternate graduation ceremony. So they just flat out ignored the denial of a permit and did it anyway. And, and so those are people who live close to me. <laughs> Out in the community. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, um, so those kinds of things. Yeah, I thought, hmm. Oh. Okay. And how did the community react to that? Well, I, there was, they were split. Okay. You know, it was very hurtful to the teachers. Mm -hmm. I had conversations with friends and, and, um, and I know that there were people who were really hurt. I'm sure there were people who didn't care. Um, but there were, there were teachers who were very hurt because they had worked hard to plan something special for the students and and then the parents undermined it and did their own thing. Okay. That's interesting. It, 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 goes, it, isn't it? Yeah. Did it, did, did it calm <laughs> down or how long did it take to calm well, down? Um, you know, I think that those things, there are other things that have happened in the school since 
and in the community sense that um, I think sort of create a divide. This is a place that has a sort of natural built-in divide anyway that's based on religion. And so there's this little schism anyway that you have to constantly work to sort of um, move past and not allow it to dictate all your relationships with other people. And I, I think it's pronounced here uh, because the way um, the dominant uh, religion organizes itself but I think it exists in other places too, just isn't noticed quite as much. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about you as a writer. The Oral History Project emerged from poetry that teachers wrote during the early days of social distancing. How did poetry and the writing of poetry fit into your life while you were quarantined? Well, I started writing about um, COVID actually in March. Um, as a consequence of a tweet that I saw about um, universal poetry or international poetry celebration or something I can't remember. And I started reading some, um, um, some poems online. And so I remember sitting in my living room and, and writing in response to some things that I read. So, so it became a way to process the whole idea of the world being on one side of a window and then myself being on another side of it, you know, because we're locked into our homes. But it, it's also, I compete, I participate in a monthly blogging challenge in March. And so March and April um, become ways to really pass the time through writing. And there are a lot of really good things about that, but there are also you know, some things that are uh, not so pleasant <laughs> about it or disappointing, I think is a better word about it. Um, but it's mainly just a, you know, it becomes a way to sort of um, just think about whatever the prompt happens to be, they're different. And with COVID being so new and people trying to find ways to deal with it, I think, you know, it's just natural to, or for people who love language and love words to try to put some ideas into, into writing. And it's interesting how a prompt in the context of a pandemic will spur a thought to something unrelated to the pandemic. But when you put them side by side, they're sort of tangentially related. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. You mentioned that um, it was, it can be disappointing too. What do you, can you expand on that? Um, well, like today, <laughs> um, you know, I really believe that when you're in a community of writers, it has to be, communication has to be a two-way street, and, and it isn't always that way. Okay. So. Okay. Did you want to expand on that idea? <laughs> um, you know, if you want people to respond to your writing, you have to respond to theirs. But just because you respond to theirs doesn't mean that they will reciprocate. And I've experienced that in, in, in every writing community I've been involved in. I try to give more than the minimum when it comes to responding to other people's writing. And I try to make sure that I'm thoughtful uh, about what I say. Um, Oftentimes in writing communities, um, there's a sort of unarticulated expectation that when you comment, you automatically must agree and must, you know, in a sense, I guess the, the, analogy I would use is treat that writer as though that writer is the emperor and you're not going to be the child on the side pointing out the absence of clothing. <laughs> if that makes sense. It does. <laughs> so I wrote six blog posts the first six days of this month where I really try to, you know, recapture my sense of humor. And today I wrote a serious uh, post and it's sort of crickets. Okay. Um, okay. So that's interesting. Um, do you think it's because of the, 
Do you think it's because of the people reading it that that's the case? In other words, they're looking for the lighthearted and not the serious or? No, it's, I just don't know. Okay. All right. I think that, I think that does happen. I don't, I don't know what's in people's mind because I'm, you know, I haven't written anything humorous in a long time. Except the boobs poem. <laughs> <laughs> which, which maybe this is a good time to, to sh have you share a poem. Is that the one you want to start with? <laughs> um, I can. It's not the one I had planned to start with. You can, you can choose a different one if you'd rather. Well, I was thinking about the poetry shifts. Okay. Let's start because, with that then. Yeah, that one I thought was uh, a good introduction to the whole idea of writing. Yep. And, and, and being part of a community of people who love language, which I think poets have to be. Po poetry shifts. First, the morning crew arrives, eager wordsmiths, morning birds pecking about the nest, excited for the daily worm prompts dangling before hungry, ravenous beaks. Fluttering hummingbirds sucking nectar in gorged lines, they flit and fly in and out of the nest as the sundials twirl, words swirl. Dusky yawns and stretches its young, tired rays across a pink horizon, signaling an awakening. Night owls emerge in silent flight and nestle in the nest. They hoot and perch on high canto branches. Their hawkish eyes revolve clocking, observing, expelling feathery ruins of posy upon a word wonder world. Thanks for sharing that. I feel okay. like that poem encapsulates everything we do in our monthly open rights. Um, there's an energy in this poem um, that, and, and maybe a slightly different feeling from some of the other poems that you were writing during that month. Uh, when I looked back and read through them, which do you think you are? Are you the? Are you typically the morning crew or the? When is your writing happening for you? I'm the morning crew. Okay, I usually the see you in there in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not even out of bed before I write the poem. Okay. I pick my phone up. I look at the prompt. I start jotting notes into my phone and composing the poem in my phone. And most of the time I'm able to get it posted early. Sometimes not so early. Sometimes I need more time to contemplate it. Do you, is it typical for you to take a step back and look at the writing again later? Or are you pretty good at saying you're good with it right at the initial? Um, I try to adhere to the, you know, no more than 10 to 20 minutes. Every once in a while, it will take me longer just because it's a longer poem and it takes me longer to get everything down. I don't spend a lot of time revising, you know, and I might go back and reread it before I post it and look for typos. I'm the queen of typos. But, um, but I typically don't spend, I mean, something will happen and, and just sort of something clicks in, in, in my mind. I, I think I think in metaphors, I like think, making comparisons. And, and when I taught, I, I tried to help kids visualize through comparisons. I really like the TED Talk, uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, um, um, TED Talk. So I, I like thinking in metaphors. Okay. I love your last two lines that expelling feathery ruins of posy upon a word wonder world. That's just beautifully written. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about quarantine a little bit further. It impact part of our approach here is looking at how it impacted schools um, and it impacted schools and states in different ways. How did your school or state respond? <laughs> I know that, okay, so you're not I teaching anymore, but like, that everything that I say is really filtered okay. through um, conversations with other people. It's not firsthand observation, but, but I know who to believe and not believe. But um, I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, a friend the other day said that they just went back to school on the first uh, full time and told me she's not sending any students who aren't wearing a mask to the office because she doesn't see the point in sending a student over to talk to a bunch of anti-maskers. 
Okay. So <laughs> I think that says a lot. Okay. So how do you think you would have approached this had you still been teaching during this time? Would you have? Oh, I know. <laughs> okay. I know. I would have been pitching fits. Okay. I would have been in the office saying a great deal and, um, you know, and, and I, I think there is, I think there are two in the administration who are anti-maskers and two who are not, two who believe in the science. Okay. It didn't take on it. So it's interesting that you're speaking to this from somebody who has retired. So you have that experience. Um, and I think it's easier to find a voice as we get older, right? Or, or maybe there's a little bit more confidence in expressing that voice. Um, do you think that there's a difference between the younger teachers being able to go through this and, and somebody who has taught for a number of years? I think, uh, yes, but I also think a lot of it has to do with personality and your training. And I've always been pretty vocal ab about what I think and, and when I see something that I don't like. And uh, I wrote about this the other day. I had, I, I wrote a blog post about, you know, my life as I called my, called it my life as a typoist. And I wrote about um, an administrator I had like the first couple of years that I taught and he evaluated me and he pointed out a typo on a handout and I said so what I'm an English teacher not a secretary so I've always kind of been a smart ass about stuff when I was hired for this job in 1989 um, the administrator um, the principal who hired me uh, was told to hire me by a, an assistant and and I coached debate at, at my old school for five years and she said she told him, she told me this, she said, I said, that's who you should hire if you want a winning debate program, but you need to know she'll say what she thinks and do what she wants. <laughs> and I think that kind of pretty much sums it up. Okay. And hence the reason you're a debate and speech teacher. That <laughs> would make sense. Yeah, I only coached um, debate five years, though. So. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so what did you discover about the state of education from an outside perspective looking in as the schools navigated this experience with COVID and quarantining and online teaching and all of the things that happened. I don't know that I discovered much. I told people last spring uh, when they were going on about how the public was so complimentary of teachers and calling teachers heroes and praising them that they should not become comfortable in that language that that would change and they would soon be vilified. And I hate to say that I was right, but I was right. I wish I had been wrong about that. But I already knew how anti-public education the country is and how anti-intellectual the country is. And I know that that sounds cynical, but it's reality and you know if you pay attention if you study and you follow then then you know follow the news and follow the trends and 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 look and see then then you know it started i don't know there have always been complaints about that in education but i think there was a real sea change with two events in the 1980s one the election of ronald reagan when he set out to destroy unions and to the publication of a nation at risk which vilified teachers and then you had the report why johnny can't read and, and these things all um, began to turn on on teachers and and this is a bipartisan uh approach to education uh, i'm not only laying this at the feet of republicans i have yet to see a democratic uh, a, a democrat and as a president who really supports educators. And I think we saw that with Biden's response to testing. Okay. What, do you have any thoughts on how that can get changed? I know it would be a gradual, you know, it would probably be a gradual change, but. No one's there to teach. Okay. Okay. That says a lot. Um, you know, <laughs> that says a lot. I know. But then they hire people who really, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think we're close to that point? 
I think we've been heading down that slope for a while based on what I've seen. So there's a guy that I worked with who, um, who did the alternate certification route, who has an overabundance of certitude about his abilities. And he hung a Trump flag in his classroom. And, yeah, and, but, you know, he never took an education law class. Um, and he, um, he thinks he knows. And he, you know, some people just aren't easy to train. And people who think that they know what they need to know about teaching because they sat in a desk are difficult to train. So I don't know. The country has to shift priorities. And it hasn't. It's, and, and I had hoped that this pandemic would, would do that a little bit, but it, it hasn't. People are more concerned with whether or not they can, you know, sit in a sports arena than with whether or not they can learn. The, what I hear from most parents is more of a concern about, you know, their daycare needs than about a child's learning. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I don't know how you change that. Um, I would have if I knew. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the answers. You know, I'm just like make an observation. There'll be some brilliant person who comes along, and you know, maybe yeah, figures it away. Yeah. And, okay. Is there a, a poem that you might want to share that reflects your thoughts about this distance learning or um, education? Or well, I think that um, I think the poem "Simultaneous Concurrent Action." Okay, that would be the one that I would say, in a sense, shows the divide a little bit and what's going on. Okay. All right. Simultaneous concurrent action. Bodies belonging to no one, unclaimed, anonymous, alien, lifeless forms, abandoned, left like refuse, stacked away, burial, and mass graves on Hart Island. Interred by hazmat suit clad diggers. Meanwhile, COVID-19 infected nurses, first responders tend the infirm, themselves gravely ill, infected, unable to procure PPE through flat lined supply chains, unlinked, broken, disconnected, vital skills more requisite than vital signs. There's a harshness to the images that are here. You had um, like the stacked bodies, the idea of refuse, abandoned, the hazmat clad diggers. Um, and there seems to be a divide too. Um, you, you start off that way and then you contradict that with the um, nurses. And so I'm wondering, do you feel like that is did you come to that divide? Was it intentional? Were you thinking about the politics and the maskers and anti-maskers and education as you were writing that? Or um, did it just happen naturally, do you think? I can't remember what the prompt was for that day, um, but I, I thought about the contrast between hearing the news and hearing about Heart Island mm -hmm. and, and New York where they were uh, storing the bodies, and even the, that the image of those dead piled up didn't have an impact on people who were uh, willing to do things that put first responders at risk. And I think that that's, you know, you have all these people who are working so hard in these hospitals, and in those early days, unable to stem the tide you know, and the numbers kept rising. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so they were, you know, their, their efforts probably felt in vain. And they were tired. And I was listening to all those stories. And that was only on March 11th. It wasn't mm -hmm. even the worse, mm -hmm. you know, the worst was yet to come. Mm -hmm. Your ending is so powerful, vital skills more requisite than vital signs. It's truly powerful. Thank you. Um, okay. We're about endings. <laughs> Beginnings and endings. 
Okay, so let's let's look at the end of well. Okay, so you weren't really teaching, but as and we talked a little bit about um, graduation at the end of that time period. Um, some of the states ended up being quarantined all the way through that school year to the end of the school year. But it sounds like your school went ahead and did a graduation. Were they quarantined? Did they remain quarantined? Do you remember? Okay. Yeah, they had sort of a drive-by um, uh, graduation ceremony with kids in cars with their parents and then the teachers lined up where they could um, respond to them. We weren't around, um, I, so I didn't go and I didn't even know if you could as the public, but, but we weren't around when that happened. When and, where, and, and where is the um, current situation? Are they in school? Are they online? What happened with the school year? They were in hybrid mode until March 1st. And March 1st is when the third trimester started, and they're um, back in the classroom full-time now. Okay. And by hybrid, did that mean that kids were going on certain days or that some students were home and some students were in the building as they were learning? What did hybrid mean for your state? Well, the elementary schools uh, were handled differently, and I think kids were there all day. But I'm, I'm not 100% positive. But secondary... Um, some kids were in the classroom and some were online. So they were in that virtual and that and and in that hybrid mode where teachers were doing double time duty. Okay, they were doing double time. Okay. All right. Um so talk a little bit more about your writing life. What connections to other teachers have you made through writing? Um well, you get to know people, you know, and you get to know their personalities and who has what in common. So it's interesting to me sometimes in, in, in our group uh, on ethical ELA to, <laughs> I know who will bypass a poem if I'm like my boob poem or something, you know, I know it's shocking to a few people and, or if somebody uses a taboo word, um, you know, I, I know it, it's a little discombobulating to some people, but I always find humor in that and love that when somebody you know, dares to venture along those lines. And I've become, in, in, um, in blogging in the two write, writing teachers community, I've become friends with some people, you know, that I've actually shared contact information with. There's a teacher in Wisconsin, you know, who, whom I've gotten to know pretty well. So you get to know people, even though you don't know them. It's a weird sort of feeling because it's sort of, you know, one of the things I keep thinking about is I wonder what will be written about being online that is sort of going to reverse the conventional wisdom about technology um, and uh, as a divider as opposed to something that brings people together because people had to use technology as a way to be able to, you know, to, to come together. But so that, I suppose. It right. Makes that technology. Go ahead. Well, Sarah's just a very generous person and a very kind person, a very nurturing uh, um, individual. You know, of I think everybody in 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 our community, much more so than I am. <laughs> well, your your comments are always very kind. <laughs> try to be. You know, if I feel like I can't say something nice about something, I scroll by it. But but it's, you know, every once in a while, some, somebody will say something that's sort of, hmm, yeah. Well, and that's part of the dilemma of, of uh, not having it in person, right, and just doing it online. Um, but having it online, okay, so as we're, as we're responding to each other online, why don't you talk about a little bit about the difference between doing it that way and if you were in a classroom or just with people in a live environment? One of the things I like to ask students is, you know, what they feel really good about with their writing and, and, and what are they wanting to work on a little bit, or is there something that's not quite working for them? You know, I ask students how I can help them. I ask them what they need from me. What would they like for me to look at? And I did this frequently in both AP Lit and in my calm 1101 dual credit uh, speech classes that I taught, you know, I, I, you know, I, because those kids are so sensitive 
So I would ask them, you know, what is it you need? What do you need from me? Where can I help best help you? Those kinds of things. But you don't have that kind of conversation online. You're looking at what they've decided is the finished product for this moment. It doesn't mean they won't go back and do something more with it. Mm -hmm. but not having that back and forth uh, conversation. I'm not their teacher. Mm -hmm. you know, years. And, and, and as, as educators and former educators. And, and I think when we have the pre-service teachers there, I think it's really important that those of us who have taught for so long uh, respond to them as though they are our peers because that helps model for them and helps them feel accepted as educators. Mm -hmm. Put them, I think, on a, on, on a, in a, a better, better footing than maybe some of us had when we entered teaching. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you said that we're not teachers in that, um, although you're modeling at the same time, which is, you know, teaching as well. Um, but we're responding to the writers in a more finished way. When you talked to your students and asked them questions about how you might best help them, what surprising, did you get any surprising answers or what was a common answer from students? Well, um, in, in my calm classes, they would show me where they're having trouble. You know, they would, they would tell me and, and what, what they needed help with or what they didn't understand. A lot of times in the classroom, I would give them a note card and have them, you know, tell me what is it, what are you understanding or what do you need more um, understanding about so that they didn't have to blurt it out or, but we did a, a lot of peer evaluating in that class and a lot of conferencing. Uh, and um, because the class was really difficult, I would give them lab days where I could help them with their research. Or, you know, a lot of times it was they couldn't find what they needed. And so I would help them with research one on one and show them some little tricks and, and both one on one and, and then um, as a class. So. So given your experiences as a teacher, what are some of the most important issues that you think teachers are facing, in addition to some that you've already talked about? I think they're not respected and so forth. That depends on geography. Okay. So much and on, on the state. Mm -hmm. um, I think for English teachers in a general sense, it's the issue of censorship. and and being able to um, introduce students to diverse uh, voices. And, and I think the issue right now is, you know, um, learning to be an anti-racist in the classroom and decolonizing the classroom, which I think is so important. And it, you know, I learned late. I wish I had realized this a bit. I knew it to an extent, so I didn't completely learn it late. I knew from early in my career that I, there were things I shouldn't do that were anathema to um, the Latinx culture, for example, when I taught in Arizona, don't point a finger, you know, that's rude. But teaching in Idaho, um, I, I also learned that, you know, there were issues um, that were of deep concern to my Native American students. We live very close to reservation, and my school was a feeder uh, school for a reservation. So one of the things I tried to do was acknowledge uh, the violent history of English, uh, the English language as a language of conquer and control of other cultures and you know when you destroy uh, um, a people's culture that's how you destroy you know um, the people and take over and so there's sort of a language genocide uh, that English is guilty of when it comes to Native American languages and dialects mm -hmm. I had a former student who visited the other day he does beading in the Shoshobanic tribe is famous for their beading and so I ordered a bracelet from him and he came over and delivered it to me and we talked about this a little bit and he is you know trying to learn the Shoshone language um, 
because it's uh, it's so at risk and this is true of other native american languages mm -hmm. um, we don't teach them in our schools you know montana montana um, has curriculum design to teach native about native cultures and the the tribes in montana idaho does not have that okay um so um you taught high school so did you have any students that would be able to speak their language by that point or had are they really not learning it they they don't learn it and if they learn it it's on their own but they don't learn it as as a class and, and not being taught in homes it's not being spoken in homes no and and covid you know has killed a lot of elders native american elders especially the navajo mm -hmm. and um you know and they teach it um they they teach the shown history and shown government and tribal government on um, and, and the tribal schools at uh Shoshone bannock um high school but and that's just a couple of miles down the road here i live really close to the reservation so that's, that's a mandated part of the curriculum so i think that's a real that's a real issue and we don't hear enough about it you know we hear more and and we need to hear about what happened to black people mm -hmm. and latinx people and, and you know and asians in this country I, this morning, you know, I heard about the uh, life expectancy for white people during COVID. It's down a year. For uh, um, Hispanics, it's down two years. And for black people, almost three years. And I looked at my husband and I said, do you know who wasn't mentioned? And he said, Asians. I said, who else? And I had to tell him, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Nothing about the life expectancy during COVID among Native Americans. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm fascinated by the idea of um, our language having a violent history. You said that it was one where um, it was one of taking cultures and taking control. Is that something that you came across or you just realized on your own? Have you done any history research on that? Well, that's English is spread in three ways war and disease are two of them and oh what is the third way you know so and 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 so it's there's it, that is english the, with the anglos the saxons and the jutes and the early history of english as a language and there's a little video online it's the history of english in 10 minutes do you know that video yeah you have the norman conquest well what happens you know when one culture defeats another then you get the language uh, there's a document called a minute on indian uh education and it, it i'm talking about in india mm -hmm. and so the british said that their job was to um to create british subjects in every way religion appearance education in every way but skin color. So English then becomes the language, the official language. And in, in this country, uh, children were removed from their homes. Native American children were removed from their homes and sent to boarding schools and far away in order to learn English. Mm -hmm. In this country, Slaves were sold away from their tribes and their families so that they could not communicate with one another. So English has a violent history as a language, and, and that's just barely touching on it. I'm not an expert, but I do know that, and I do know, you know, what um, colonialism was like. And we're a, we're a colonized continent, mm -hmm. Australia. New Zealand, Canada, and the United States are settler territories. So we were calling, you know, we, we colonized. And 
All right, that's fascinating. I would love to talk with you more about that, honestly. Um, but we are out of time. I don't want to take much more of your time. Is there a poem that you might want to close with that speaks to anything that we've talked about or that represents you as a person or that you just feel like sharing? Um, I'm looking. I'll share this one that um, I wrote um, that was based on the young boys harassing the first African-American family to move into the all-white neighborhood. Last night, I dreamed I saw a young Don harassing the first African-American family moving into his all-white neighborhood. He stretched tiny fist and raised rage, spittle foaming from his mouth, a circle wrapped around his hate, bellowing a bubbling brew, feeding a clan of creepy kids, misfits like him from a Flannery O'Connor short story, who believe in Jesus and justice, just not the God of love. His barbed wire words stretch like a cabled line, reaching across history into infinity, still measuring others, not by the content of their character, but by the color of their skin. Their shithole homes. Now a squinting shadow stands spewing and shoveling the same slop while around the resolute desk the boys swarm. swarm. He ain't learned nothing. And so it goes. Who knew in this child a good man would be so hard to find? And then I added a note, additional inspiration from Eve Ewing's. I saw Emmett Till this week at the grocery store and Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. Such an incredible piece that really goes along with the way we ended this interview. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us today, Glenda. Thanks, Jennifer. Much appreciated. I'm going to stop recording.